Hello, uh, welcome to this episode of the Martial Arts Studies Podcast. This is my dress rehearsal for the conference presentation that I am going to give slash will have given in Sheffield at the uh, Martial Arts Studies Conference um, from the between the 19th and 21st of July. So that'll be past tense for you, but it's... Um, Future tense for me. So here goes. Um, paper is called The Sublime Object of Martial Arts Studies. My title can be read in two ways. This is because object may be one of two things, noun or verb, already present thing or future desired goal, object or objective. Keeping both of these meanings in play, I want to argue that both the focus and the goal of martial arts studies are related to the sublime. Just that, it's related to the sublime. Both the present subject, both the present object, martial arts, and whatever it is that leads us to study it has a relationship with the sublime. And that this is so in relation to the meaning, to both of the meanings of the word studies, both in the practical study of a martial art and in the academic study of this object. Something about the object or objective is sublime or could be, perhaps should be. This begs the obvious question, what is the sublime? The ultimate answer to this is, it depends who you ask. There are differences and disagreements, but most tend to agree that the sublime is that which causes a certain affective response or incomprehension, being overwhelmed. It's not simply an objective property of the world, like gravity, but it arises at the interface of objective properties of the world and subjective experiences of them. For Edmund Burke and for the Romantics, the key distinction relates to the difference between sublimity and beauty. The sublime is entirely distinct from the beautiful, the beautiful is contained and containable. The sublime is boundless. Some, like Burke, made lists. The sublime is dark, ancient, immense, seething, measureless, tumultuous, terrifying. But lists never capture it. What one generation finds sublime, the next finds boring. Indeed, what I find subl sublime today may bore me next year. The classic depiction of the sublime is a figure beholding a landscape, a mountaineer on a peak or a ledge or a ridge or a rope beholding the Alps or the Dawn Wall or K2, or a mariner beholding the immense surge of a sea storm. What many have theorized about this sublime scenario is that the figure in the landscape experiences the sublime to the extent that they are overwhelmed after surviving the danger. The sublime is the moment of, wow, I could have died, but they didn't die and were in fact confirmed or strengthened by it. More recent scholars have emphasized that even the romantic interest in the sublime reflects less what they thought it reflected, the power of nature, and more a reconfirmation of the brave, conquering, colonizing, manly man. What also needs to be noted is that in the artistic depictions of a tiny subject in an overwhelming landscape, it is not the subject in the midst of the action that is overwhelmed and awestruck. It is the viewer of the scene, the person looking at the figure in the landscape. Of course, in psychoanalytic terms, this may actually be the same person, just at different times. While I'm conquering the dawn wall, I may feel nothing other than the rub and pull of very real challenges like gravity. But later on, when I look at a photograph or film, or when I reflect on the past moment, that is the person who might experience the sublime. The person in the moment is a grafter, someone who has effectively mastered the sublime, evacuated, evaded, or neutralized the sublime. To experience the sublime is the moment in the moment would be incapacitating. Like mountaineers, martial artists know all of this in different ways. 
The sublime is the pool of deep, dark secrets and skills you are facing. Some discourses are more occult or orientalist than others. But in all of them, when you interact with your seniors or superiors, the experience is overwhelming. What happens to you, what, what happens to you in the melee is incomprehensible. The first feelings or intimations of peak experiences in form or kata or qigong or fighting flow may feel like communing with the spiritual realm for a moment. As Slavo Zizek puts it, the sublime can only be glimpsed sidelong. If you stare at it, it vanishes. But as such, it is a promissory moment. You want it to experience it again. It was amazing, terrifying, but you survived. Surely the next time it will be more, better. As Peter Sloterdijk sees it, it is ethical, transformative, leading to commitment. This is the place and function of the sublime in martial arts. It is connected to, but distinct from the psychological notions of flow, on the one hand, and edge work, on the other. In flow, time passes unconsciously. Activity is effortless and all-consuming, all-engaging. In edge work, one pushes and is pushed to the limits, beyond the limits, expanding the limits of the comfort zone, or rather the discomfort zone. But the sublime exists primarily in both a retrospective and anticipatory promissory mode. The newbie wants that experience. The expert wants it again. But to get it, the sublime must paradoxically be evacuated or, limited, or, or um, eliminated. One must not be overwhelmed because overwhelmed means incapacitated and incapacitated means dead or dying or sitting duck. Flow may name the profoundly nourishing reward of any activity and edge work may name the quest for just enough challenge, but the sublime names both promise and reward. The sublime recedes. The sublime is a vanishing mediator. Your first experiences, your first intimations may overwhelm, but all of your actions from that point in pursuit of the sublime must make it move out of reach, like the end of a rainbow. The pursuit of the sublime um, evacuates it from a situation to the extent that one's discipline, one's training, leads to the mastery of this, that situation. One becomes a different subject, the subject who can do this in that situation. This subject is calm, collected, possibly even clinical. In Wayne Wong's reading of Taoist aesthetics and martial ideation, such a subject can be understood as a sublime figure. The black dot in the white circle, the white dot in the black circle, the heart in a heartless world, the still point in a turning world, a hawk taking a bird your instructor, an assassin, a machine. There are, different ideal, there are different discourses of the sublime, different ideological renderings, Taoist, Confucian, Romantic, Stoic, Christian, Greco-Roman, Orientalist, in fact, very often Orientalist, and more. The sublime can be translated into many different terms, Manifest in more different, manifest in many different figures: Lao Tzu, Ip Man, Jesus, Antigone, Rene Gallimard, Bruce Lee, silent and still in the melee at the end of Enter the Dragon, Jason Bourne. Many potentially sublime narratives use pragmatic discourses to puncture the sublime. When discussing near mystical, near impossible feats in moments of combat. Self-defense expert Rory Miller undercut the possibility of a sublime discourse with sentences like, that was the moment I realized it was only a job. Sublime ability, ability to deliver the sublime requires an inoculation against experiencing it. Many other discourses orientalize it. Mushin, no mind, is one of the sublime objects of martial arts training. It exists cinematically in Bruce Lee's I do not hit, it hits all by itself. 
or in Tom Cruise's Nathan Algren's dispatching of multiple attackers in Meiji-era Japan in The Last Samurai. This is the sublime of flow, an orientalized flow in which the word I does not exist and there is only the deed, not really the doer, only the dance, not the dancer. None of this needs to be orientalized, but in and around the Asian martial arts, this tendency is overdetermined. It is overdetermined by the history of European romanticism in which we are still living, in which the sublime is the East and the true East is the deep sublime. Whence the appeal of aestheticized violence? The intense experiences of both viewing and training martial arts and combat sports and the enduring and tenacious status of Orientalism in some such practices, the unnameable, inexpressible, overwhelming, overpowering, appealing je ne sais quoi or something extra of martial arts, either as spectacle or as practice, may be the sublime. Certainly, martial arts, combat sports and combatives are neither beautiful nor are they simply brutal and violent. Rather, they are sublime, awe-inspiring, terrifying in their magnificence, transformative and confirming of the subject, whether pr practitioner or viewer. Because of the enduring legacies of Romanticism, this is always right for orientalizing. In short, the sublime names the dominant affect that is encountered both in viewing and in executing or experiencing martial arts, qua effective technique or technical mastery in what is otherwise the chaos of violence. If sublime experience is an affect of martial arts, we might ask, what is its relation to martial arts studies? What is the object of martial arts studies and what is its relation to the sublime? We can answer this question quite prosaically, first of all, and propose that there may at least be value in a reconsideration of the notion of the sublime, as it may offer valuable but hitherto quite neglected theoretical and analytical reserves for martial arts studies. Certainly, there seems to be a connection between the major aesthetic theorizations of the sublime, Burkean, Kantian, Hegelian, Zizekian, and arguably Taoist, to some abiding fascinations in both practitioner and scholarly martial arts discourses, as well as enriching the conceptual field of martial arts studies. This might also deepen its potential connections to cutting edge research in such areas as psychology, sociology, aesthetics, religious studies, and of course, affect studies. A focus on the sublime need not mean a retreat into the comfortable disciplinary enclaves of old fields like aesthetics or philosophy. If the sublime is an affect, then it is tied at once to the personal and the political. As Laurent Berlant once argued, affect studies can be understood as today's iteration of ideology studies, studies of the most intimate interfaces and interactions of the public and the private, the individual and the social, or indeed the subjective and the objective. Similarly, Slavoj Žižek's sublime object of ideology was principally organized as a theory and a critique of ideology at the same time as it tried to be a kind of call to arms in the name of revolutionary politics. Of course that call has failed, at least it has so far, and arguably so it should. Ideology criti critique is not the place to tout another ideology. But studying effective dimensions of practices, disciplines, routines, institutions, mediations, forces and relations should certainly be part of the object of martial arts studies. The je ne sais quoi, the I don't know what, the inexpressible certain something that a practice or a situation has or gives or produces definitely has a claim to being deemed a proper object or objective of fields such as ideology studies or cultural studies or martial arts studies. To paraphrase Trinity in The Matrix, it is the question that drives us, that eats away at us, 
What is the effect of je ne sais quoi, the I don't know what, the inexpressible certain something that a practice or a situation or a situation has or gives or produces? What is it that drives the practice? So, by the same token, what is it that drives the academic study of the practice? To answer, let's revisit the sublime differently. One of the most famous poems in the English language is Kubla Khan by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Written in 1797, it has come to be regarded as one of the definitive texts of English Romantic poetry. It is also an almost point by point walkthrough of first a Burkean and second a Longinian understanding of the sublime. And it is also an exemplarily Orientalist text. In the first lines, we hear that Kubla Khan in the Far East, in Xanadu, wants to create a stately pleasure dome. This was a miraculous and inexpressibly awesome object, a magical, mystical miracle of rare device. Then there is an unimaginably powerful event, both tectonic and sexual in nature. The earth convulses in a kind of orgasm. At this point, the scene changes, as does the tempo and the rhythm, as the narrator switches to a recollection, a vision he once had of a damsel with a dolce man. All of the scenes, scenarios, acts and actions in Kubla Khan are simultaneously Orientalist and sublime. This high point of English Romantic aesthetics attests equally to a deep investment in the sublime and in Orientalist images and imagery. The first half of the poem is focused on the events surrounding Kubla, its construction and the earthly tumult. The second and final half concerns the narrator's desire to be able to communicate what he's seen and heard. The music and song of the damsel was so profound that could he convey the affect in words, he would attain a kind of demonic demigod status. The perfect communication, the putting into words of the inexpressible or sublime je ne sais quoi of the motor forces that drive us forward in so many things would not to Coleridge's mind be a representation, but rather a kind of transport, a kind of being there. This is a problem that faces all kinds of studies that deal with practices with an affective dimension. As Loic Vacant pondered in his famous ethnography of boxers in Chicago, how do you communicate the inexpressible feel of an embodied practice, of skill acquisition, of the pleasures and pains of effort? How do you translate or transliterate soma aesthetics into words? Vacant chose to mix literary and academic modes to juxtapose different genres and conventions of representation, to try to paint a subtle and nuanced picture of something that does not exist on a canvas. Others might say thick description, or it's the description thicky. Still others seek to transcend or escape the confines of the written word and engage digital AV, VR and AR technologies to try to transport us there to the moment of the object. Elsewhere, others seek to conceptually manage the size and shape of the object. In fact, there are any number of objects of martial arts or any other studies. What you do with your object of attention is very much determined by where you are situated in the academic disciplinary terrain. In the arts, humanities and social sciences, the most supposedly self-evidently valid way to orient studies of objects and practices is to assess them in terms of their ethical, political, or ethical, political dimensions. Other kinds of assessment, evaluation, and even recommendations are made by other academic orientations, tourism, management, economic, health, business, and so on. The point is, the justification, aim, objective, or alibi invoked to validate or legitimate an academic orientation is neither universally agreed, nor obvious, nor trivial, nor inconsequential, 
the primary and constitutive. Put differently, if a student asked me if they could study improving martial arts management or marketing, I would say no. Well, not exactly. The reason is not that management or marketing are not part of the proper object of martial arts, or indeed the study thereof. It rather reflects my own disciplinary orientations and the kinds of questions I have either been trained or have learned how to deal with or dispatch in particular ways. Ways which reflect my disciplinary training and hence orientation and identity. These ways are styles and we are products of our styles. And these styles become institutes with fixed forms, protocols, yardsticks, measures, and kinds of identities. Bruce Lee disapproved of all of this, not least because styles become in some sense dead in the face of their object. Surprise, joy, excitement, and certainly confusion, and even creativity become evacuated. The professor is rarely someone you can surprise in their own realm, or rather, even if surprised, they have their response. Natural unnaturalness, unacting, acting, acting, unacting. The expert, the master, to the extent that they are what they seem to be, is the one whose discipline structurally anticipates the surprise, preparing them in predictable ways, professor or sensei the same. Others may view this expertise with incomprehension or wonder or fear or an inexpressible attraction. This real or apparent mastery may seem sublime to the witness, or it may just seem to have that certain je ne sais quoi, that inexpressible appeal. At the end of Kubla Khan, Coleridge describes the phantasmatic reception of the person who could capture and communicate the sublime in words. And all who heard should see them there, and all should cry, beware, beware, his flashing eyes, his floating hair, weave a circle round him thrice, and close your eyes in holy dread, for he on honey dew hath fed, and drunk the milk of paradise. Forgive me. In the end, I know this has all been romantic, poetic, and effective. Some might say affected, but the romantic, poetic, affective, and even affected dimensions of both martial arts and of all studies should not be ignored or overlooked. Physicality is never merely physical. Academic work is never disembodied, airy, cerebral, or merely dispassionate objective words. There are deep emotional, intellectual, psychological, ethical, and physical dimensions to each. Of course, there is a sense in which my presentation on the sublime here today has been hyperbolic. Maybe investing in the fantasy of capturing the sublime is a pure case of what Berlant would call cruel optimism or a metaphysical fantasy as realizable as sticking a pin in a cloud. But as much with academia as with martial arts. To quote the hard man footballer Vinnie Jones, who we see here, at his most acting, unacting, or unacting, acting, it's been emotional.